Heavy. Thank you, Louis. Um, it really is a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Niluva Karimian today. Nilu um, has great expertise in environmental geochemistry, particularly of metalloids like arsenic, antimony and chromium. She'll talk to us today about some of those elements. Um, she is one of those um, rising stars in, in environmental geochemistry. Um, she has more than 20 publications and these have come out of um, her work in soil science. She's going to tell us a little bit about that, obviously, in her talk. Uh, but she started working on soils um, as an undergraduate at uh, in the uni at was it University of Tehran in Tehran, um, doing a bachelor's in soil science and engineering. After that, she did a master's. Um, in soil science, chemistry, and fertility. And following that went to Southern Cross University, which has um, a lot of expertise in this area. So Nilu was um, awarded her PhD in 2017 and her PhD received the Chancellor's Medal for the outsta most outstanding PhD thesis. So attesting to her um, the quality of her work Today, she's going to tell us about some of that work and the various ways that she has approached trying to understand these horrible elements that are horrible, but also interesting um, in acid sulfate soil wetlands. So it's a great pleasure to introduce you, Nilu. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Penny. Thank you, Louis, and thank you, Wu. Um, thank you all for um, actually uh, allocating your time today to um, to join my uh, seminar. And I want to thank you. Um, it is actually a great pleasure for me to uh, present at RSES, and I want to thank the organizers and specifically Professor Penny King for the invitation. <clears throat> As being mentioned um, uh, by Penny, <clears throat> I am an environmental geochemist, and at the moment I'm doing my postdoctoral research at Southern Cross University, Southern Cross Geoscience Research Center, and I'm a member of Environmental Geochemistry and um, Mineralogy Group with the leadership of Professor Edward Burton. Uh, my research, and um, uh, in broad term, uh, I would say that I'm interested in the applied and fundamental aspects of the environmental geochemistry and mineralogy. And um, my research exploring how changes in mineralogy um, affects the fate of the contaminants in soil, sediments, and groundwater. And um, I actually am really interested and passionate with the cycling of iron. Uh, iron sulfur and recently manganese and i want to see how the cycling of these um, like elements will influence the and control the bioavailability speciation and um, actually the behavior of uh, a wide range of trace metals and metalloids with the specific interest on arsenic antimony and chromium in the environment so the discoveries that i make uh, through my research it they actually have um, uh, applications for developing sustainable uh, and specifically low cost remediation technologies. And it will give us some idea about the behavior of trace metals and metalloids in the environment. At the moment, my work is like a combination of field work, going to the field, taking either natural contaminated samples from wetlands, from mine affected environments, or uh, just uh, synthesizing my samples, my minerals of interest inside the laboratory, and then um, analyzing different parameters on them using wet chemistry techniques or advanced uh, like um, spectroscopy techniques, uh, for example, synchrotron based analysis, um, XAS analysis, which is actually a part of my research and a very important part of my research. And it used to be like this since the beginning of my PhD up to now. So uh, by using these sort of techniques, for example, the X-ray absorption spectroscopy, I can get some very good idea uh, about my samples, about my the behavior of trace metals and metalloids, and I can interrogate my samples down to the molecular level to understand how they are associated with the uh, surfaces of my interest. <clears throat> For example, if I have like arsenic or antimony speciation, like in contamination in a soil, it is important to know if they are 
uh, locked into the structure of a specific mineral or phase, or they are at the surface, um, like absorbed at the surface. Because, you know, during the future, like transformation of these minerals, they are likely to release to the environment. And if they are, for example, locked inside the structure, the chance of release is lower. And then the speciation is another thing that uh, these sort of techniques, like synchrotron techniques, will uh, provide information for us. And um, speciation is directly related to the degree of toxicity and environmental you know, like accessibility of a wide range of trace metals and metals. So that's what I'm doing, more or less, like a very brief uh, introduction about what I'm doing at the moment as a postdoctoral researcher at Southern Cross Geoscience. And um, uh, I think I, I want to just start by uh, giving you a little bit of uh, my story, very briefly, uh, where, should, where I started and where I came from. Um, I am Persian, and I was born and grew up in a beautiful city in central part of Iran, which is called Isfahan, with a lot of monumentals and historical traces. And um, I finished my study of the bachelor, uh, my master of science in back in Iran. I have a bachelor of science in soil science engineering and a master of science in soil chemistry and fertility. And uh, the master of thesis project that I have finished, actually it had a very uh, like um, good influence on me to for, uh, on me to pursue a PhD in the field of environmental geochemistry. Um, and um, uh, when I finished my Master of Science, um, I decided to pursue my PhD uh, in environmental geochemistry and mineralogy. And then um, I was lucky enough to find, um, to get the PhD uh, scholarship of uh, Southern Cross University. And I moved to Lismore in 2013, uh, and I started my um, PhD under the supervision of Professor Scott Johnston and Professor Edward Burton. And it was on the assays of this, and it was just the, the like the beginning time for me to get familiar with these very interesting and important environmental settings. And um, the focus of my PhD study was on understanding the, the like the cycling of iron and sulfur minerals and the, the consequences for the trace metals and metalloid geochemical behavior under fluctuating redox conditions. Um, and then in 2017, I was graduated with my PhD. At that time, I got the Chancellor Medal for the Aldous Science PhD thesis. And immediately after finishing my PhD, I started my work as a postdoc research fellow um, in the Environmental Geochemistry and Mineralogy Group um, uh, with the supervision of Professor Edward Burton. And this is the place I'm still uh, working and conducting my research. But for today's presentation, I actually want to um, share with you some of the interesting results and um, uh, like outcomes from the couple of projects that I have conducted uh, during my PhD and on the issue of assay software source or related to the conditions that are relevant to the acid sulfate or wetlands or acid mine drainage affected environment. And you will see them in the next slide. So um, I think before going through the main studies and uh, my like results, um, it would be a good idea if I provide you with a very brief introduction of the acid sulfate soils, um, be specifically for some of you who may not be familiar with these environmental settings. I try to keep it short, but please bear with me for a couple of minutes and then I will go through the main uh, like slide um, about my study. So, uh, what is uh, an acid sulfate soil? What is the definition of the acid sulfate soil? Acid sulfate soils are soils and sediments that contain appreciable quantities of um, uh, sulfuric, sulfide rich minerals. For example, pyrite is one of the most famous ones that many of you will probably have heard about. But it's not just pyrite, it could be other forms of iron sulfide minerals like iron monosulfides, um, machinoite, marcosite, graveite, or um, these sort of uh, sulfuric rich material. And uh, also the reaction products resulting from oxidation of these kind of sulfuric minerals, for example, acidity or the uh, like the secondary iron tree mineral phases like gerocyte or shrapnelite, which are very common in these sort of uh, soils and sediments. Um, the worldwide distribution of the acid sulfate soils, as you can see here in this um, map, is about estimated to be about 50 million hectares. And um, uh, in different parts of the world, in Asia, Scandinavia, and Africa, we have the distribution of the uh, inland or uh, like coastal and sulfate soils. And look at Australia. Here in our country, we have about 215,000 square kilometers of the distribution of the coastal and sulfate soils. And um, 
you can see that we have it. We have this issue in almost all the geographical like the direction of our country. So this is the important issue for Australia. Um, for the acid sulfate soils to form and for the uh, like sulfuric material to accumulate in a soil profile, um, a number of conditions should be met. First of all, we need a stores of sulfates um, in the soil. It should be enough. And then we have like iron minerals, um, uh, which generally are abundant in the soil. We need uh, organic matter to provide fuel for the bacteria. And then we need sulfur reducing and iron reducing bacteria. And uh, we need like the anaerobic conditions. Or like the water logging conditions. If we have all these uh, conditions available for our soils and sediments, we may end up with uh, like accumulation of pyritic material or other kind of iron sulfur, sulfur minerals, depending on the path phase and the time that is passed for the accumulation. So uh, the pyritic material that we have, and uh, they, are, they have the potential to be acidic, uh, they are termed as potential acid sulfate source generally, and they are stable under reducing conditions as far as they are not disturbed. Uh, here you can see the uh, like the uh, framboid of pyrite, the SCM image of this uh, framboid. And uh, then we have the potential acid sulfate source. Um, um, if they are not disturbed, they're going to be like benign and they will not pose any problems to the environment. But there are many anthropogenic activities and also natural phenomena. Um, such as drought or with anthropogenic activities like the excavation or the drainage for the agricultural purposes, they can disturb these poten uh, the, uh, potential acid sulfate source and they result in the oxidation and degradation of these uh, sediments and soils. And then we have the transformation of these potential acid sulfate source to actual. When we have the actual acid sulfate source, it means that we have the accumulation of sulfuric material. Um, in our sediments, and this acid um, can be released to the environment if we have the rainfall event uh, following like the dry season that we that resulted in the formation of acid. And um, one important, uh, another very important thing which should be noted with the acid sulfate source is the changes in mineralogy, iron and sulfur mineralogy over time. Uh, initially, as I mentioned, we have the iron sulfide rich material, and then we have the oxidation. This material will transform to um, uh, shrapnelite, gerocyte, or other kind of iron tree containing minerals, uh, the secondary iron tree minerals, which are very different in terms of characteristics and how they can act as uh, like scavengers for a wide range of trace metals and nucleus. So it is a very important issue that needs to be taken into account in these uh, soils and sediments. So we know that we have the acid sulfate soils in Australia, and we know that they are significant. Why they are significant? Because the environmental impacts of acid sulfate soils and sediments are large, either in scope or in scale. Um, and the impacts that they could have on the environment, they generally occur after the release of the acidic um, like soil water to the adjacent environment. It can result in the degradation of soil or um, the corrosion of the infrastructure after some time. It can affect the health of the aquatic creatures like and result probably in massive fish kills, as it was reported in uh, some previous studies and observations. Even for human beings, um, skin irritation, and lots of other things that are directly or indirectly related to acid sulfate source. So we have these impacts and the, the potential impacts of the acid sulfate source if there is not enough buffering capacity in our soils. And this issue is real. So what we can do to remediate this acid sulfate source? So far, uh, various remediation methods have been developed to um, overcome the unfavorable uh, like outcomes of the accumulation of sulfuric material and trace metals and nucleus inside the soil profile of the actual acid sulfate source. But many of these methods, um, for example, the number one up to number three, as you can see here in this slide, by elution, neutralization, bio alkaline reagents, and containment, they generally are expensive um, and uh, costly, and some of them are only partially effective. And they are not the scope of my uh, research, to be honest, and I don't want to go through them. Uh, my focus and uh, my area of interest is like the reflooding of the acid sulfate source using fresh water, um, the restoration of the actual acid sulfate source using either seawater or fresh water is um, based on uh, the geochemical reversal. It may sound a bit uh, like complicated, but it's not. And it actually is based on a very simple principle. It means that if we have enough sulfuric material in a soil profile, 
we have um, organic matter and we have the bacteria and we reflood and we cover our um, actual acid sulfate source with either sea water or fresh water and we step back and we let the bacteria to start their work after some time and to start the reduction of iron and sulfate uh, then we will end up with the in-situ alkalinity as you can see here the reaction uh, so both of these techniques may will end up with the accumulation of um, in-situ alkalinity, which is a completely desirable um, outcome for the um, restoration of these, uh, like and using this technique, specific technique. Uh, but there are some principal differences between seawater reflooding and freshwater reflooding. My focus is freshwater reflooding, so I will just cover a couple of very different, very, very important differences between these two reflooding system and uh, technologies. And then I will go through uh, the other slides about this um, um, remediation technique. So uh, with the differences between hydrological and geochemical um, like the processes between freshwater and seawater, I should say that the main, the most important one is the, the fact that with the seawater inundation, we have the possibility of resupplying some of the annoyance, very important annoyance, such as sulfate and bicarbonate, because of the nature of the like seawater. Uh, however, we don't have this possibility and um, you know the luxury with the freshwater uh, reflooding because it's just based on the precipitation and rainfall. And if we for any reason, we uh, we have the lower concentration of sulfate in our sediments and samples, uh, or, or the fresh water. Uh, then it will not be uh, replaced um, in a short period of time, and we may end up with the stoichiometric imbalance um, when we want to have like the um, equal equimolar of, for example, sulfate and iron three in our samples, or or iron two in our samples that will end up uh, with the formation of um, iron sulfide material and we may end up with uh, some of the um, uh, some of the for example non-crystalline um, iron sulfide bases in our samples rather than like on um, pyrite which is more uh, like um, which is which is not as uh, as sensitive to oxidation as for example mackinwood or iron monosulfide um, and we will get the quick oxidation of the surface sediments of this soil um, and sediments the other difference, which is very important, is that with, when we cover uh, the actual acid sulfate source with seawater, um, the surface water of these sediments, they actually experience the narrow range of uh, fluctuations and redox oscillations. And this is because of the nature of the tides um, in um, seawater. However, with fresh water, and specifically for the soils and sediments that are located in the climates that are highly dynamic, as we have in Australia, in every part of Australia, in the dominated climate, and we know that. Um, and we will end up with um, lots of fluctuations in um, rainfall and then dry like episodes. And then um, these sediments that we are that we cover them with fresh water may experience large seasonal oscillations uh, in the redox condition. Uh, to, um, to see that if it is actually a real issue for our soils and sediments in Australia, and specifically for the wetlands that I conducted my um, experiments on them, um, that's good to have a look at this um, uh, diagram, which shows the annual water balance of the east coast of Australia in northern New South Wales re region uh, for the duration of 1880 to 2012. Um, and it clearly shows like a large seasonal decadal scale oscillations in, uh, uh, in water level. Uh, and it shows like drought is inevitable in these sort of climates. And the, the soil and sediments that are covered with fresh water in these in this part of the world and in this part of Australia, they will experience extreme redox oscillations. And um, there is always a potential for the exposure of the newly formed reduced inorganic sulfur species that are generally accumulates on the surface of these sediments uh, to oxygen. But what is uh, happening if they are exposed to oxygen? Looking at this schematic diagram probably give you a good idea about what we expect during a wet dry cycle. Here we have the reflooding of the acid sulfur soils um, uh, with fresh water. And as you can see here, everything sounds uh, like reasonable and desirable. We have the alkalinity generation um, 
as, as I referred to the, uh, like to the reaction, the institutional alkalinity. pH sounds good, it's, it's around the second neutral pH, and um, the reaction of, uh, and the reduction of sulfate and iron results in the accumulation of uh, reduced inorganic sulfur species in the surface. Uh, this is the um, actually project, and the, this is the process that ends into formation of alkalinity. This is good, and we have the um, uh, like the newly formed uh, iron sulfide, iron monosulfide, iron disulfides uh, in the sediment. But if we have like the um, onsetting of the dry, dry conditions and a drought happens, um, what uh, what is happening is uh, quite interesting. Uh, the surface water will um, will disappear after some time, and then because we have the accumulation of reducing organic sulfur species in the surface, oxygen can penetrate, and these um, uh, iron sulfide minerals they are generally really oxygen sensitive, so they will be oxidized very quickly, and uh, they will transform uh, to iron three containing minerals such as jarosite and shrapnel, as you can see here, and then um, acidity will be accumulated in the soil profile. Uh, as far as we have the dry conditions and the drought. And then after the first flash of rainfall, enough to make the runoff, uh, that acidity, which is already locked inside the uh, profile, soil profile, it can, really, can be released to the environment. And not only the acidity, some of the toxic trace metals and metals which were previously bound to the structure of either um, like jarosite, shirtmanite, or previously in the structure of the iron three, uh, iron sulfide minerals or um, sulfidic bases, they can also be released to the environment. And it can pose lots of um, like um, negative risks for the, for the environment. So having this background, um, we, we decided to uh, find answer for some questions and be, um, to conduct our experiments, which I'm going through after this slide. Uh, we wanted to understand if we have like a freshwater deposit acid sulfate sulfur plants located in um, um, redox, oscillator, uh, redox oscillatory sort of climates, um, what will happen if we have a dry condition? how much acidity will be produced if we have the dry condition and how fast this acidity will be generated. And what are the consequences for the toxic trace metals and metalloid mobility and release to the environment? So to find answer for these questions, we conducted uh, different experiments. Um, and we actually took our samples for the first two experiments that we can see here, number one and number two, from two freshwater reflooded acid sulfate soil wetlands located in the eastern part of Australia, um, in, near Port Macquarie. Uh, and we conducted, um, firstly, we conducted the drought oxidation uh, and the um, drought simulation experiment to see what is the effect of dry conditions on the sediments. And then uh, we actually try to um, make the opposite scenario when we have the riveting and the rainfall and how long does it take for this uh, already oxidizing sediment to become again um, like completely anoxic and to generation of the reduction of sulfur species in them. So uh, as I mentioned the first experiment was the um, drought simulation experiment and um, the main objectives are to quantify the acidity generation dynamics and to examine the geochemical cycling of iron and sulfur over the, uh, the um, duration of the uh, drought simulation. So we took our samples from these two wetlands, Jarawak wetland uh, and Potter Creek wetland in eastern part of Australia. And we took our samples from the uh, topo sequence to have a good idea about different elevations, different initial reduction of any sulfur species. Uh, because these two wetlands, they are already uh, reflooded with fresh water since 2004 and 2005. We knew that we have the accumulation of um, reduced um, inorganic species in the surface of them. So we took samples um, and um, we uh, transferred the samples to our laboratories um, at Southern Cross University. Uh, before going through that, um, this crocodile site <laughs> like was there in one of those wetlands. But Actually, we, we don't get crocodiles in the uh, like, you know, in the areas near like Port Macquarie. But if I didn't know that for the newcomer to Australia, I think some of us just wanted to joke with us. But for me, it was enough to give me a heart attack <laughs> as a newcomer to Australia. Um, anyway, so we took our sample from here and um, from these two wetlands, and we transferred them to the uh, to the laboratory uh, in our in Southern Cross Geoscience, and then we started the drought simulation. 
for 130 days and we let the samples to be oxidized um, um, and they oxidized very quickly. Um, we took our samples in different time intervals and we measured a wide range of uh, like um, parameters in our samples to get some idea about uh, their uh, transformation of iron and sulfur minerals and also the um, rate and extent of the acidity generation. What we observed um, and what we got um, in terms of results was very interesting. Uh, we observed that the surface um, layers of both wetlands, um, which were um, covered with fresh water, they were highly prone to uh, rapid oxidation and uh, the highest rates of activity generation occurred in very short period of time, somewhere between seven to 20 days, maximum of 20 days following the oxidation um, like simulation. And then um, another thing that we observed was like the risk of acidity generation uh, for our sediments uh, and the samples that we got was not uniform um, over the, uh, you know, the topo sequence of the wetlands. And samples uh, that we took from lower elevation, they had higher concentration of reducing of sulfur species in them. And then they generated um, more acidity in a shorter period of time. And it actually highlighted the fact that these sediments are really oxygen sensitive and they can be oxidized um, in very short period of time. Uh, so we got this idea about the oxidation experiments. And after that, uh, we decided to conduct another experiment, which was even more important than the first one. And we wanted to see what is the case scenario if we have uh, the rainfall even following the, the prolonged dry conditions, for example, after 130 days, then we have get, then we got rid of all the pyritic material or the iron sulfide material, and all we have is acidity in the uh, soil profile, and also probably some trace metals and metalloids, which is blocked in the uh, oxidized soil. So we conducted the second experiment to get some idea about uh, like the uh, quantify the short and longer term kinetics and mobility of uh, some of the selected trace metals and metals during the course of reflooding, and also to examine the geochemical cycling of iron and sulfur and to see what is happening in terms of mineralogy. How long does it take for our samples to get back to the completely anoxic condition and uh, to the formation of uh, like iron sulfide phases? So. What I did um, was like I took the samples that I got from the former experiment, the oxidized sediments. And because this time I didn't want the presence of oxygen, I conducted the whole experiment inside the anaerobic chamber. Um, and I reflooded my actual acid sulfate source from the first experiment with um, artificial acid sulfate um, water. And I inoculated them with some um, acid sulfate soil um, water that we got from the wetlands uh, to make sure that we have enough bacteria uh, in them. And then what I did, I just um, let the sediments to sit there inside the anaerobic chamber, and I took my samples for, for the duration of 12 weeks. And then I took my samples in different time interval, and I measured lots of parameters in the soil and sediments and water uh, to, um, to monitor the changes in water quality in these uh, experiments. So, the results that we got again for this experiment was quite interesting. Um, what I observed was like uh, when, they when they reflooded the actual acid sulfate soil with fresh water, uh, we will see the pulse release of acidity and trace metals and metals, which was very rich in aluminum and manganese and zinc, in less than a week following the uh, you know riveting experiments, and they reached to their peak in less than a week. And pH was very low at this stage uh, during the first week of the um, like. Um, reflooding. And then uh, the mineralogy that we observed was uh, dominated by shrapnelite, the iron, iron tree phase of shrapnelite. And then at this, the second stage of the uh, freshwater reflooding was um, it happened very quickly, which was the iron and sulfate reduction. Uh, and it occurred somewhere between two to four weeks following the freshwater reflooding. At this stage, uh, because we had the uh, reductive dissolution of shrapnelite, the iron 2 concentration increased. And at the same time, uh, which was very cool, uh, the antimony, the, uh, the arsenic uh, release was also observed in the uh, you know, aqueous phase. Um, and it actually told us that these two, uh, like um, uh, the, the, the reduction, the reductive dissolution of shrapnelite and the release of anti arsenic or antimony or any, any kind of other um, like 
um, metalloids uh, are somehow related to the transformation of these um, minerals in the soil. So at this stage, somewhere between one to four weeks following the freshwater reflooding, we observed the gradual depletion of shuratmonoid in our sample and um, initially increase of iron 2 concentration and arsenic and then gradually decrease and finally uh, somewhere between four to six weeks following the first water uh, reflooding, um, the the um, the space was depleted from um, any of these trace metals and metalloids, aluminium, um, iron two, and arsenic. Um, the formation of um, iron sulfide minerals, which had the visual indicator, uh, the the black color, um, which was from transformed from actually the orange like brown color of um, the initial iron tree containing mineral was a good indicator that we have the uh, formation of uh, iron sulfide minerals in our sample. And then um, again, a bit, uh, um, bit uh, similar to other trace metals and uh, trace metals, arsenic also disappeared. It shows that probably it was sequestrated inside the structure of uh, newly formed iron, um, iron sulfide minerals in our experiment. So, um, Although with these two experiments that I already mentioned, uh, we got some, some good ideas. We, we knew that uh, the oxidation of the um, surface sediments of uh, fresh water reflood as the sulfur soil wetlands can occur in a very short period of time. But at the same time, if you want to remediate these sort of sediment, um, we can see like a rapid reversion of the anaerobic conditions and the sulfur reducing conditions to occur and for the pH to increase. And it takes about four to six weeks for our samples uh, to recover. So it was um, an interesting um, like discovery with these um, uh, two experiments. But the third experiment, uh, that we conducted after finishing these two. Uh, it was based on this part of this diagram. Uh, I mean, week uh, two to three uh, of this diagram. Then we had the reductive dissolution of shreddonite and the release of arsenic um, and the increase of iron two in our sediments. The reason that I wanted to conduct the experiment based on this um, results was that when we have the uh, accumulation of iron three containing minerals under the uh, uh, like oxidizing conditions, Gyrosite, for example, is one of the very uh, common uh, iron tree containing minerals uh, under oxidizing acidic conditions. And because this um, uh, mineral has really high uh, surface area, it generally is considered as a very potent scavenger for a wide range of trace metals and metals, including arsenic and antimony, which are um, my metalloids of interest. And um, I wanted to see if we have um, like gyrosite in our soil profile or in conditions relevant to acid sulfate, so which could be actually attributed, which could be similar for the acid mine drainage of the environment too. Um, what will happen if we have the reflooding conditions and then we have the formation of iron 2, as we observed in the former slide, iron 2 in our sediment, and then the reductive dissolution of gyrosite occurs, uh, which already had the arsenic and antimony locked in its structure. What will happen in, uh, to the arsenic and antimony if we have the reductive dissolution of gyrosite or the transformation of gyrosite to other minerals? Are they going to stay in the structure of gyrosite or are they going to be released to the environment? And if yes, in which uh, oxidation state? Is it going to be arsenic 5, antimony 5, or arsenic 3, antimony 3? Because it's very important. The trivalent form of these uh, trace metals and metals are generally more toxic than the pentavalent of them. So I wanted to see what is happening in terms of the mineralogy and also in terms of the uh, speciation and mobility of arsenic and antimony in my system. So this time I designed a very different experiment, purely laboratory based and uh, uh, with the focus on arsenic and antimony. I didn't have natural soil for this uh, experiment, so I synthesized my own mineral, which was the gyrosite. And I um, actually incorporated arsenic and antimony in their pentavalent form um, inside the structure of my synthetic gyrosite. So why I chose arsenic and antimony? I have some reasons because these two um, like contaminants are toxic and they are carcinogenic, and um, they announced as the pollutants of the priority interest in the uh, last four or five decades. And um, uh, the inorganic species of them, they uh, actually can be more toxic in their trivalent uh, form. Uh, and also another fact that um, uh, urged me to actually conduct this experiment was that 
there is like a cons the, the assumption, the pre-assumption uh, in the literature that these two metalloids like arsenic and antimony, because they are located in the first uh, group of the periodic table of elements, they behave similarly. And this probably is because the because the the, uh, the studies on antimony is is not comparable with the number of studies that have been conducted on arsenic. And um, the results that generally um, we get from arsenic behavior, they, uh, they try to be attributed to antimony too, which is not the case. And we know that this picture is incomplete, specifically now with the research that we conducted and our group conducted, we know that this is not um, you know, the case. And I will share with you the results after some time. So you can see that the behavior of these two trace metals and metalloids are very different from each other. So because of all these reasons, I decided to work on these um, um, like in mineral, gerocyte, and these trace metals and metals, arsenic and antimony. So as I mentioned, I uh, synthesized my gerocyte inside the laboratory following the, uh, you know, the protocols that were available. And I co-precipitated uh, arsenic-5 and antimony-5 inside the structure of my uh, synthetic gerocyte. And, um, I actually conducted this experiment under completely reducing conditions. So again, I used the anaerobic chamber uh, to put my samples there and to start the experiment. So what I did uh, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to add a, to add iron two um, to my um, gerocyte suspension, and um, I wanted to have a range of different pH to be representative of different stages of freshwater reflooding. Um, I had pH 4, pH 5.5, and pH 7 um, buffered um, um, for my samples. And pH 4 was representative of the initial acidic conditions, pH 5.5, the middle stages following reflooding, and pH 7 uh, when we have the, uh, like the onset and complete um, like the prevalence of the anoxia. And we have second neutral pH conditions. And I wanted to see. If we have these conditions and we have concentrations of uh, enough and different concentrations of iron two, what will happen to our mineral? Like which in, in my case was gerocyte in this study, but gerocyte. And if gerocyte transforms to other minerals, what will happen to arsenic and antimony, which were initially locked inside the structure? So I conducted my experiment inside the anaerobic chamber and I took my samples uh, in the time intervals that you can see here in this slide. So what happened was really interesting and the observations were quite fascinating because what I observed was the effect of pH and iron 2 was really like significant. Then I added my iron 2 solution uh, from the FeCl2 soak to the initial, to my first batch of experiments which were, uh, which were actually buffered to pH 4 and um, germicide uh, didn't transform to any other kind of minerals. And it stayed uh, as, the, as gerocyte over the course of the uh, incubation and anoxic incubation. So pH4 resulted into no mineralogy transformation. But it wasn't the case for pH 5.5. Then I added my iron 2 solution uh, to, um, to gerocyte suspension at pH 5.5. After about one hour, uh, I observed the formation of new phase and it was obvious from the color change in you know, my samples too. Then we uh, analyzed our samples using XRD and, it, and then after that um, uh, by X-ray absorption spectroscopy analysis with synchrotron X-ray absorption spectroscopy, um, we make sure that this um, actually this um, phase that occurred one hour following the addition of iron two was green rust, and then this green rust in uh, but gradually transformed to a goethite phase uh, by the end of the experimental period, which was 24 hours, and it was short-term experiment. So it was different from the acidic pH, and then when I increased the pH by about two units, the rate and extent of this transformation was even faster. So I added my iron two to this. Um, uh, suspension at pH 7 and brain rust formed in even less than 10 minutes of addition of my uh, iron 2. And um, it, it was stable for, for some hours, like up to about eight hours, and then it transformed, completely transformed to goethite by the end of the experimental period. So the transformation of the iron 3 mineral was evident from my samples and um, the effect of iron 2 concentration and pH was also confirmed. But 
what we are, I was looking for and my main question was the behavior of arsenic and antimony during the course of mineralogical transformation of gerophyte. What happened to arsenic and antimony? Here you can see the repartitioning of arsenic and antimony during gerophyte transformation. The observation was really interesting. And what I, what I noticed was that these two trace metalloids not only behave differently from each other on, under different pH conditions, but they also behave very different from each other under similar pH conditions, which, which actually contradicts the former uh, and the previous assumptions that these two metals, they should behave similarly or they probably could. So uh, when in the pH 4, because we didn't have the mineralogical transformation, we didn't expect that much of change in the repartitioning of arsenic and antimony, and it was the case. So with pH 4, it was everything was all right. But with pH 5.5, um, what we observed was the uh, repartitioning of ars arsenic, which was initially locked inside the structure of gerocyte to the surface, about 10% of arsenic uh, repartition to the surface, and then um, about 70% of that uh, remained uh, in the uh, at the residual uh, like in partition or fraction, um, which was a good news because if they are look, uh, like if they are locked inside the structure and in the residual uh, like fraction, it means that even if we have uh, like the future transformation in our mineral for any reason, transformation or even just recrystallization, uh, the risk of release of this trace metals and metals to the environment is not um, that high and it actually is very low. But if they are bound to the surface as it happened to arsenic here, 10% uh, increase in the surface, then it probably is the case scenario that we will see the release of arsenic to the environment. So we observed that for arsenic, but we didn't see the same thing for antimony. And it actually stayed into the structure or it was locked to the um, corticrystalline phases that were uh, extracted by the molar HCL. And a little bit of um, like um, aqueous release of antimony was observed at pH 5.52, which wasn't that much significant, but about 5%. But in pH 5.5, these two trace metals and metals, they behave very differently from each other. This time, the surface absorption of arsenic was even higher. It was about 25% um, of, um, of arsenic, which actually uh, moved to the surface of goetite because gerocyte wasn't gerocyte anyway, it was goetite at this stage. So goetite, um, surface absorbed goetite. And then, with, uh, and the rest was uh, stayed in, uh, inside the structure. But what happened with antimony was different. Um, and it's released to the environment, like to the aqueous phase, um, in less than 24 hours. About 26% of antimony uh, was observed inside the about aqueous phase, and it stayed there over the uh, course of the mineralogical transformation, and regardless of the uh, mineral that formed either green dust, gerocyte, or goetite. So antimony, um, antimony's mobility increased during the uh, mineralogical transformation of gerocyte. But, and it was significant because it didn't change over time too. Um, but the rest of the antimony, the, the rest of the percentages of um, uh, like the partition of antimony stayed locked into the structure of the goetite, which was a good news too because it was the higher percentage. But the difference between these two uh, trace metals and metals in terms of geochemical behavior was a really interesting understanding about these um, uh, samples, these samples. Uh, so, now we know that our arsenic is surface absorbed and um, about 25 percent of that at least which is which is not like a very high percentage but still uh, it can pose some risk to the environment but it's important to know if this arsenic is arsenic three like the trivalent or is the pentavalent arsenic because as i mentioned the pentavalent form of arsenic and antimony they are less toxic than the trivalent so we actually analyzed our samples um, for uh, this speciation and we took our samples to the synchrotron to see if uh, this arsenic is arsenic-3 or arsenic-5. And very interestingly, we saw that um, with our arsenic, uh, we have a little bit of shift um, in the, uh, like the edge of arsenic-5 towards the edge of arsenic-3, which shows that we probably have some electron transfer from arsenic-5 to arsenic-3 and we have some reduction. So 
a proportion of that surface absorbed antimony that is now at the surface of boetite could be arsenic free. And it means that if we have in future, we have the, the transformation um, of the soil sediment, or we have the change in pH, or whatever conditions that can result in the transformation of the mineral, may, re may res result in the release of that surface bound antimony to the environment, which at this case could be arsenic free too. So, it was a very interesting um, understanding about these um, samples too, but it wasn't the case for antimony. And, and I, I, I didn't show the results here, but when we um, uh, analyze our, sa our samples for the same uh, like um, analysis uh, in the synchrotron, we observed that antimony 5 stayed as antimony 5 over the course of mineralogical transformation and it didn't change. So this experiment that I conducted, um, it actually was like a uh, was conducted in a very pure system. They didn't have any natural organic matter, as you saw. They didn't have any bacteria or anything in the system. It was just pure, uh, like, um, abiotic uh, iron 2 catalyzed transformation of gyrosite. But this is not the case for natural soils and sediments. And we know that we have, like, different uh, type of organic matters and we have, uh, like, bacteria in the system. So for our next experiments uh, and the series of other experiments that we conducted so far, we applied all these parameters in our um, experiments and we uh, we try to like um, monitor the changes in mineralogy and in iron um, iron sulfur and if, if we depend on uh, which mineral we are looking at um, and recently manganese to see how the mineralogical transformation of iron manganese minerals uh, will affect the arsenic and antimony behavior and in the presence of um, um, like different concentrations of um, humic acid or in the presence of bacteria, like this one, biotic experiment. But obviously I cannot cover all that research here uh, and in this presentation. So I will wrap up my um, like presentation at this stage and uh, give you a summary of, the, of my talk. Um, in this presentation, we came to know that um, acid sulfate soils uh, impacts can be very substantial. And this is a real issue for Australian soils and sediments. Mm, and the management challenges that we face uh, for the dynamic climates, uh, and specifically the climates that mm, experience cyclic oscillation are very important and they are real actually. And we know that there is a complex interplay between um, hydrology and redox conditions for iron and sulfur mineralogy and this regulates the contaminant fate, and you saw it in the case of arsenic and antimony in our sediments. Therefore, I would say that a sound understanding of the evolutions in the mineralogy and uh, the corresponding uh, behavior of the associated, either uh, associated or co-occurring uh, like in contaminants and uh, trace metals and metalloids under Lactating with those conditions is essential uh, for designing um, uh, appropriate management strategies and to get good idea for, um, you know, probably even providing and preparing the models for the behavior of these stress metals and metalloids in the environment. So I finished my uh, talk at this stage. And um, if you are interested in um, like understanding more about iron, sulfur, and manganese, um, like um, redox cycling, or you want to know more about arsenic and antimony or chromium, uh, please talk to me. And I'm always um, happy to have a chat about uh, all these uh, trace metals and metals and the mineralogy uh, in acid sulfate soils and acid manganese affected environment. And uh, please look at our um, social media and profiles for our papers and publications. Thank you so much for your attention and your time, and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you, Nilifa. No that worries. Wonderful talk. Thank and, you. Uh, it, these talks always end in a funny way because um, people can't really clap. It's not like a normal <laughs> audience. So anyway, um, Hopefully you see some claps in the, <laughs> on the screen. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have a, a question for Nilofa? So I, I thought it was really interesting, um, the wetting 
drying cycling of these elements. Yeah. Um, how much, so you've, you've essentially flooded your samples. Yeah. Do you think that you can do similar things with very tiny amounts of water? Okay, so what I did actually, uh, the experiment that I conducted was uh, like uh, I used the um, uh, batch experiment. So I used the, uh, you know, small um, uh, tubes um, and, you know, the centrifuge tubes and just to be representative of the, the actual soils and sediments inside the, you know, the real wetlands. So I think it needs, um, if, if I got your question properly, um, it needs actually enough coverage of the surface sediments that we get the anoxia. So it should be appropriate like um, concentration or the volume of water on the surface to, to actually encourage the anoxia and um, to, to let the bacteria to start their work and iron and sulfate reduction occurs in these systems. But what I did, I used like the 50 milliliter centrifuge tubes and inside the anaerobic chamber. And um, I just wanted the consistency in all my samples and to get to like the, to be able to repeat the you know, experiment to get good um, replicants. Uh, so that's why I did it. But I am sure, pretty much sure if they want to get to, like the real conditions in the field and in acid sulfate of the plants, they need to have a good cover. But how many meters or something like that? I'm not, I'm not I cannot say actually, but it should be covered, properly covered to, to encourage the reducing condition. Yeah, cool. Uh, I see a hand up now. Who is A? Go ahead, A, and ask your question. <laughs> Hi. That, that, that's me. Hi. 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 I, I'm uh, watching you from uh, Athens, Greece. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's winter here, and we are in quarantine, so we are okay. in lockdown. And, yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, my background is geochemistry, and yes. uh, we have also been studying arsenic in Eastern yes. Mediterranean. You know, Mediterranean is also a hot spot for arsenic. Yes. There are many natural sources, uh, including volcanoes and uh, marine hydrothermal vents. Yes. And uh, we have been also studying sediments and soils, and I have three questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, we, we have some problems studying arsenic and antimony. One question is, how can you how can you characterize all of these uh, 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 iron faces like uh, svetmanite or uh, green rust? Or, yeah. Because may, perhaps some amorphous or semi-amorphous yeah. or nanocrystalline, you know. And exactly. Yeah. Using X-ray diffraction, it's very controversial. It is. It is. You That's why. Yeah. Can, you can Do you want to ask one by one, and then I I go through the. I, I respond to your questions one by one. That that would be better. I yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You can also use so, sorry. You can also use X-ray absorption, but again, yeah. you need standards, and yeah. don't, we don't have a, a standard. And yeah. Like, yeah. Have you have you tried uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy? Or, I did uh, exactly. Yeah, all right. Yes, right. I did. I That's did. The first specifically, person. yeah, and specifically for my. I think I have this slide here. I hope I have it. Um, you know, specifically for a face like green rust, because yeah. uh, I didn't have any experience with that, and it occurred in my sediments very accidentally. Uh, we didn't expect the formation of green rust, and you know that it's really oxygen sensitive, and uh, you know, preservation of green rust it's very challenging. So what we did, uh, we actually I tried to we, we actually kept it inside the anaerobic chamber for the whole duration mm -hmm. of the experiment, and then. For the transmission electron microscopy, we wanted to make sure that it is like um, uh, green yeah. rust, and we ended up with green rust. Uh, I have it in my paper. Uh, let me show it to you. I could probably mm -hmm. have it here. Maybe let me see. Okay. Yeah, yes, right. this one. This one. This is the you know here that you all can see right. the yeah, color right. change. Initial gyrocyte and then green rust, green bluish color of gyros. Uh, sorry, green rust in my samples, and then the the transmission electron microscopy confirms the presence of green rust in my sample. So yes, you are right. Uh, we need other techniques rather than X-ray absorption spectroscopy and synchrotron techniques. Uh, sorry, uh, X, X, XAS techniques is the best one. We make our uh, like standards um, based on different conditions that we may think. And you know the XRD patterns, they generally help us to make our standards and what we expect in our samples and then we can do the linear combination fitting. And this is like a function. We can make sure that 
you know, there, there is like a percentage of mineral, how, how many, how, how much is the percentage of one specific mineral, what, what is dominant, what is not. And I think this is the most like powerful tool for us to understand if, if there is like a specific mineral in our samples or not. So synchrotron-based X-ray absorption spectroscopy is the best, except. So yeah. do you, do you, have you also uh, found uh, amorphous phases like uh, uh, iron, amorphous iron sulfides, uh, amorphous arsenic sulfides? Uh, in, in my experiment, in this experiment, mm. I didn't. In, so actually. in soils or, because, you know, amorphous arsenic uh, sulfides or yeah. iron sulfides are very common in marine environments. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but it's not actually the, the, um, the scope of my thesis, it's out of the scope of right. my, sorry, the research. And at this, at that time, it was out, out of the scope of my thesis. But generally speaking, um, yes, you are right, they occur. And um, I, I didn't co-occur with them in my uh, like experiments. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, they can. And the, the Did you try spiking your, samp your samples for the XRD so that you could come up with a total content? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So you do know it's there. Excuse me? So you have some quantification of the total amorphous concentration? Oh, it's, that's very difficult to do it. <laughs> yeah. That's so, very difficult. Well, if you yeah. spike it with yeah. a known quantity, then you can do it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there are different techniques. I, I remember like, like from one of my experiments, we spiked our samples with chromium. Uh, with like, uh, you know, a specific percentage of condom in all the samples to keep it like, you know, uh, similar in all the samples. And then we normalize the peaks based on that one to get some idea about, you know, the uh, co-occurrence of different phases and different peaks and stuff like that for the XRD. That's what we did for, you know, sometimes then we, we are not sure about the, you know, the uh, broadness of the peaks and we have like amorphous, not very well crystalline. Yeah, it's, it's really hard, but I'm wondering, was it more than 50% or less than 50%? Oh, I think so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, yeah, it would be less. It was about 50%. I okay. think so. Yeah, okay. about, probably less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have uh, one more question. Please, yeah, of course. There yes. is time. So uh, you, you showed us uh, uh, this uh, nice... Uh, uh, Zane spectra of arsenic, but yeah. which is rather easy to distinguish arsenic five and arsenic three. But uh, we we also we always have problems with antimony. I mean, mm -hmm. have you tried uh, Zane of antimony? Because of course. the L the L lines the L lines are very are very uh, let's say uh, doubtful, and you yeah. have to use K lines. Yeah, I don't know if then if if uh, you know we use uh, a synchrotos in Europe to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, you can do it in uh, in Australia. Yeah, to, we can do it. Zane is with K lines. Exactly. You, you know, oh. you you are absolutely right. With this experiment, with the first experiment I conducted, um, we actually didn't uh, we didn't go to the Australian synchrotron at that time. So we went to Taiwan synchrotron. All uh, right. And That's yes, what exactly. I asked. And we had the we had the difficulties at that time yeah. with antimony. Because so we ended it. up with LH, not KH. I, I, okay? I was wondering if you can, I was wondering. If you can if you can do it in Australia because yeah, we, we, went, but... we went to Japan. We oh, went to okay. Japan to spring aid and but it was not very easy. Even okay. even even yeah. So no 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 with, with arsenic in Australia, with antimony in Australia. With, we don't have any, any easy everywhere. Exactly. Yeah, but, but with but antimony, antimony we can do it in Australia beautifully with no problem nowadays. So it was right. uh, we had problem in Taiwan, but nowadays in for the rest right. of our experiment, we co we conducted a lot of experiment after that on antimony, and we always run a uh, cage, and we got really good results. You know, using the cryostat. Uh, so we didn't use the room temperature holder; we used the cryostat. So you get K K K K. Yes. You use the K heads of yeah. antimony. Yeah, yeah, for oh, antimony. Right. Yeah, yeah. Good. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I'll get a look in your publication. Yeah, definitely. So I can write also my name here because I don't know why I'm named uh, say that's my name. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for. No worries. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, you're lucky we didn't kick you out with that name, actually. Uh, that, 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 that's my name. Uh, okay, I, I wrote my name. Yeah. So yeah, we are we are also trying to do similar things, but uh, you know, not in soils. In okay. And marine sub. So thank you very much for. 
No worries, no worries. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. It was a lovely talk. Are, are there any more questions? So, um, Boon, do you want to take over from here or should we um, just let the, the, the people who want to ask more questions stay and you can go? I think, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if there's more questions. No, I think Ace just left his hand up. Yeah, I think if, if that's the case, maybe uh, we can uh, just end the session right here. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much again for presenting your work and I just really enjoy all the animations. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I really enjoyed it too. Thank it was you. a very clear talk. I think it was great from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Boone. All right. Uh, have a lovely.